Welcome to Step Up ASU. The goals of Step Up are to increase motivation, skills, and confidence in responding to behaviors that threaten a person's health, safety, and well-being through awareness education, dialogue, intentional thought and action, how to effectively assess a situation's safeness and necessity to intervene, walk you through the processing of deciding to help, including personal and community risk assessment and barriers that prohibit us from intervening, equip you with intervention strategies, direct and indirect, and give you an opportunity to practice. Throughout this presentation, you will notice a common theme of individual leadership and shared responsibility and how these two concepts intersect in such a way that promotes our shared role in feeling a part of a community and then taking care of that very community as if we have built it with our own two hands. Because in fact, the decisions we make to lead or share responsibility creates and confirms the social norms and unspoken rules that we live by in our very communities. It's the concept of taking ownership and pride in what we can do individually and what we can accomplish together. What does it mean to step up? To rise to the occasion, to make a significant difference, to bring your best when the situation demands it the most. Why do people always step up? Many watching this presentation may have been in a situation during which they could have intervened but didn't and then later on said, if only I would have done something, said something, talked to someone. We've all been there. Take a moment to reflect on how you felt. Did your conscience nag you afterwards? This is exactly why you're participating in this module today, to motivate and empower you with skills and confidence to step up when you have an opportunity to make a difference. And how can we do this? By having and understanding a pro-social behavior and bystander intervention. Pro-social behavior is any act performed with the goal of benefiting another person. Pro-social behavior examples include helping, this can be casual, substantial, emotional, emergency. Anything from opening the door for someone to helping in a natural disaster or a national emergency. Cooperation. Your individual decisions affect your peers and community. And lastly, altruism. This is aiding another without the anticipation of rewards from external sources. Bystander intervention. This is the interruption of behavior or speech by someone who is present, a bystander. This can be direct or indirect. It can be emergency or non-emergency. Let's think about this for a moment. Have you ever acted on behalf of someone else? How did that feel? Has anyone ever acted on your behalf? How did that feel? I think we can all admit that it feels good and it's good for our community to be pro-social and active. So what factors determine the likelihood for someone to step up? Three factors that determine the likelihood include individual characteristics, situational characteristics, and victim characteristics. We're going to take a look at each one of these factors in the following slides. So individual characteristics are variables like knowledge, skills, confidence, sense of social responsibility. Do you feel qualified to step up? In this presentation, we are advocating a sense of communal responsibility, which ultimately drives pro-social people to step up in times of trouble or necessity. Situational variables are things like severity of need, number of other bystanders present, cost of helping. Many of us have heard of the bystander effect or the diffusion of responsibility. Essentially, this phenomenon causes us to assume that others present will take care of someone in need or act in the event of an emergency. Victim characteristics Those are things like the appearance of the victim, friendship with the victim, perceived deservedness, whether they accept help or not. Essentially, the way we perceive a person in need can greatly alter our likelihood of helping them. But let's first ask ourselves if our perceptions are valid. So which one of these variables do you think is the best predictor for helping? The answer is situational variables are the best predictors for pro-social behavior. So here we are taking our first look at our step-up model. Can we relate the factors we just discussed to the step-up model in any way? First, we notice the event. We are aware of our surroundings, even though you may possibly be distracted. We need to interpret problems. Maybe situations can be interpreted different ways. Ambiguity is a large problem for society and our community, ourselves, and someone else. Next, personal responsibility. Ultimately, we always think that someone else will do something. Let's completely rid ourselves of that mindset and take personal responsibility and ownership of our community and interactions. And finally, decide how to help. In order to step up, we must first know how best to help in any given situation. Assessing the situation. Okay, now that we have some basic terms and concepts covered, let's dive into assessing the situation. Pay attention to the people in this video and take note of the steps they did or did not take and whether they actually resulted in help. Take a look at the situation and identify what did or didn't determine whether someone decided to intervene.
What would you do if you saw someone, especially a child, in trouble? Would you jump in to help or assume that somebody else would do it? Recently, we went to the streets of suburban New York and put some folks to the test. Last time, security specialist Bill Stanton put two parents to the test to see if what they've taught their kids about the danger of strangers would serve them in a real-life situation. Today, he puts the public to the test. With the help of seven-year-old Raquel, Bill staged an abduction to see if the public would take action. Raquel's mom, Deborah, watched from a surveillance van as Raquel was approached by Bill. Hey, where were you, young lady? It's unbelievable, but they oh, did nothing. Bill and Raquel repeated this time after time. Hey, please, someone help me! You're not like that! Please, someone help me! You're not like that! Please! Still no response. It's frightening that, that nobody would help. One woman walked right by, believing someone else would take action. Oh, go away. And why didn't she do anything? You think that uh, someone else will take the blame, someone else will take the responsibility. A police sergeant on location to supervise was stunned. I felt it was unbelievable that people just didn't want to get involved. They'd look, they'd, they'd turn around, they'd see with a commotion, but they just kept on walking. Uh, they didn't want to get involved, in my opinion. Bill would have been long gone with seven-year-old Raquel. It took hours, but two men finally listened to their Someone instincts. Help me. You're not like that. Someone help me. You're not like that. Someone help me. You're not like that. Someone help me. You're not like that. Someone. Someone help me. Oh, 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 oh. TV, 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 TV. Cops right there. It's cops right there. Good what job. are some factors you noticed that caused someone to intervene or not? For the reasons not to intervene, where did the process of the step-up model stop? Some examples. Not noticing the event, not interpreting it as a problem, not taking personal responsibility, or not knowing how to help. Part 2. Making the decision to step up. There are many reasons why we might not choose to step up. The three main concepts we'll be addressing are 1. Conformity. This is the idea of fitting in, going with the crowd. 2. Submission to perceived authority. And 3. Diffusion of responsibility from the individual to a mystical other person. Here's a closer look at some of these concepts. Dr. Darley says that just one person stepping forward in a crowd can transform the group from passive to active. The thing that haunts us, I suspect, is that might have happened on the Detroit Bridge. It is a question that haunts Harvey Mayberry every day. For the rest of my life, I'm going to have to deal with that. If I had done this, then maybe she still be here. But it took one person to step forward still, and nobody did. And nobody did. But I honestly believe if one person had to step forward, because I know I would have, but uh, to be the first one, no. We can all find ourselves on that bridge, and we could all find ourselves not responding. But if we understand why that might be so, we are more likely to be free to respond. We have to go against our socialization and help others. The real story on the Detroit Bridge was that there was bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. The young lady barely rear-ended the man's car. He went into a rage, pulled her out of her car, and beat her. He went back to his car, got a tire jack, and attacked her again with the car jack. She had no choice but to jump into the river to escape her attacker. She could not swim and drowned. What are some ways that other people could have stepped in to help save this woman? What are the outer limits of conformity? Historically, it's the Holocaust, where a single authority figure, Adolf Hitler, influenced countless others to act against reason and good conscience. Here at Yale University in the early 1960s, psychology professor Stanley Milgram wondered whether the Holocaust was a uniquely German experience or, under similar circumstances, 
Would any one of us have the same capacity for evil? Here's how the Milgram experiment worked. Subjects like this man were told they were part of a study on memory and punishment. Punishment they would deliver to this man from this ominous looking machine. This machine uh, generates electric shocks. The subjects were told they'd have to give the man shocks after every wrong answer in the memory test. And the voltage would increase from slight at 15 to intense at 255 to the unimaginable at 450. But what the subjects didn't know was that the machine wasn't real, and it wasn't a memory test at all. It was a test of obedience to see if everyday people would inflict pain on others just because an authority figure told them to. My role was to give commands to the subjects uh, to get them to go to the end of the machine. The man in the lab coat, John Williams, 35 years later. When you first saw that machine, did it ever occur to you that someone would go to the very end? No. This one will be 195 volts. Oh. The correct one. Let me out of here. Slow. Dance. Let me out of here. My heart bothered me. Let me out of here. You have no right to keep me here. Let me out. 195 volts. Anguish cries to stop. And they're not the first pleas for help. By this time, the subject believes he has shocked the man with the phony heart condition 13 times. Let me out of here. You have no right to keep me here. Let me out. He looks back to the authority figure, John Williams, for relief, but doesn't get it. Let me out. Continue, please. Let me out of here. My eyes bother me. Let Go me on. out. Let me out. But instead of walking away, he tells Williams he won't be responsible, allowing him to feel less guilty, yet still obey. That is incorrect. This will be at 3.30. The correct phrase is rich boy. Let me out of here. My heart's bothering me. Let me out, I tell you. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. You have no right to hold me here. The next phrase is let fast. Me let me out. Let me out. Let me out of here. Let me Bird, out. Bird, car, out. train, plane. Silence. Is the man unconscious? Dead? Why won't the subject just stop? Continue. Because of the commands to obey. Notice how non-threatening the situation is and how everyone in the situation looked to the leader for help. Not everyone who agrees with you or laughs at your jokes is your true friend. Just how far will people go to please the crowd? As you'll see tonight, much farther than you'd ever think. Here's Dawn Fratangelo. When it's least expected, you're elected, you're the star today. Smile, you're on candid camera. This man finds himself in a strange predicament. So does this man. He's in an elevator facing front, but inexplicably, everyone else is facing the back. It's the dilemma presented by TV's candid camera 35 years ago, pitting individuality against the pull of group pressure. He's very unhappy. You'll see him. He doesn't know whether to go inside and face front or outside and face back. <laughs> Here's a fella with his hat on. Over and over, the unsuspecting TV stars all reacted the same way, like sheep. A moment later, we'll open a door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> Although it was just for laughs, Candid Camera also raised serious questions about conformity for all of us. Would you be strong enough to stand up for yourself if you're a minority of one? How powerful is the pull of negative group pressure? We wanted to know. So Dateline enlisted Professor Pretkanis and his psychology students at the University of California, Santa Cruz to replicate Dr. Solomon Ash's classic 1950s conformity study. They did what Ash did, design a simple exercise matching the line on the left with the one of identical length on the right, and then have the students who were plants give intentionally wrong answers, claiming, for example, line one on this card is the right match. One. 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 The subjects, always in seat six, are then faced with the experiment's fundamental question, 
conform by giving answers they know to be absurdly wrong or defy the group and give answers they know to be correct. We'll start with Marie. As she hears the clearly wrong answers, One. One. She glances at the leader, One. seemingly for help, yet she sticks to her guns and defies the group. Three. And keeps disagreeing. Three. 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 Although her resistance is never easy. One. As Marie stares intently at this card, she can't believe her ears. One. 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 The urge to join the group and conform builds with One. each wrong answer, and she suffers One. for every right answer she gives. Two. What does she finally One. do? Three. 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 Two. She would not conform. There was a lot of pressure in that room. There was a lot of tension that I felt. I can see where somebody would buckle and just lose it. And you didn't like being different? No, but I didn't want to be wrong either. Up next, Brian. What will he do? One. One. The first few times the plants pick the obviously incorrect line, Brian confidently defies the group. One. Three. Confident because just look at the card. Of course, the only logical answer is three. And this card, nobody could possibly say anything but three is the correct answer here as well, right? Just watch. Two. Notice Brian's eyes start to droop, and listen to his voice get softer. Three. When the group gets it wrong again, and again. Three. Three. Two. For four rounds now, he's been fighting the good fight against conformity. Three. Three. But with the pressure mounting. Three. 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 He just can't fight anymore. Three. And in succeeding rounds with Brian continuing to give answers he knows to be wrong. Two. Two. He only gets sadder. Two. And softer. Three. By the final trial, he's a thoroughly One. beaten man. One. I gave up. One. There were times when I didn't even look at the uh, lines and said the answer. One. I became quiet, decided that I wasn't playing the game right, so I just played along. Conformity is also known as normative influence. We conform to the group's rules in order to fit in, be accepted, be liked, or avoid conflict. The spiral of silence is the idea that a person is less likely to voice an opinion if they feel that they are in the minority or fear reprisal or isolation from the group. But silence perpetuates misperceptions. It discourages the majority's opinion while encouraging problematic behaviors from the minority. Thus, individuals who do not personally engage in the behavior may still contribute to the problem by their silence. Overcoming the spiral of silence is possible. People with greater influence or individuals who do not fear isolation are likely to speak out regardless of public opinion. On a related note, groupthink is when group members try to minimize conflict and reach consensus without critically testing, analyzing, or evaluating ideas. Groupthink may cause groups to make hasty, irrational decisions where individual doubts are set aside. This is due to a desire to avoid being seen as foolish or to avoid embarrassing or angering other members of the group. Unfortunately, normative influence usually results in group compliance, which means doing or saying something without believing in it. What prevents you from speaking up? What could you do to get others to voice their disapproval with you? So there's one way to mitigate this behavior, and that's for leaders to step up. Leaders ultimately give permission to others. So be the first and set an example amongst your peers to step up. Be the catalyst. Notice how one person in this video mobilizes the entire group. If you still can't decide, remember that ultimately falling into line, especially in the context of antisocial behavior, can be dangerous to yourself, your friends, and the community. That is why we are encouraging all Sun Devils to do their part and step up. So ask yourself, what would I want someone to do for me? 
What could happen if I didn't step up? Part three, strategies for effective helping. So here are a few tips for effective intervening. First, approach everyone as a friend. Don't be antagonistic. Be honest and direct whenever possible. Recruit help if necessary. Keep yourself safe. Don't use violence. Instead, seek emergency assistance. And if things get out of hand or become too serious, contact the police. Try to use I statements when helping a friend. I care lets the person know that you care about them, and because of the significance of your relationship, you need to discuss something very important, both starting and ending the discussion with an emphasis that you are doing this out of genuine concern, caring, and respect for the person, sandwiches the difficult feedback between strong positives. Choose words that you are comfortable with and fit your style. I see statements report and review actual events with your friends as you perceive them. Remember you are evaluating the behavior, not the person. Try to limit your statements to observable, irrefutable facts. The more you have, the better. I feel statements tell the person your own feelings using I statements to reveal your feelings. I want statements tell the person what you would like to see happen. I will statements specify what you will or will not do. Only set ultimatums if you can and will stick to them. There are many ways to intervene. The following video shows several step up strategies you could use. We got you on camera. Don't follow. We got you. When we stop again, get off. Okay, she not follow me. Please get off. Several interventions can be seen in the subway video. There is someone who is trying to direct the man on the subway while another man is trying to distract from the situation by stepping up between them and eating. Another person is delegating and telling the woman to go over there. These and other strategies can be used in many situations. The four D's guide us to effective strategies for intervening. Direct, distract, delegate, delay. How would you use the four D's in this scenario? As the evening wears on, your friend Sam meets up with Jamie. The two of them have been drinking and flirting. You hear Jamie invite Sam to leave the party. Step one, direct. Step in and address the situation directly. This might look like saying, that's not cool, please stop, or hey, leave him alone. This technique tends to work better when the person that you're trying to stop is someone that knows and trusts you. It does not work well when drugs or alcohol are being used because someone's ability to have a conversation with you about what's going on may be impaired, and they may be more likely to become defensive. Distract either person in the situation to intervene. This may look like saying, hey, aren't you in my Spanish class? Or, who wants to go get pizza? This technique is especially useful when drugs or alcohol are being used because people under the influence are more easily distracted than those that are sober. Step three, delegate. Find others who can help you intervene in the situation. This might look like asking a friend to distract one person in the situation while you distract the other, which is known as splitting or a defensive split. Asking someone to go sit with them and talk or going and starting a dance party right in the middle of their conversation. If you don't know either person in the situation, you could also ask around to see if someone else does and check in with them. See if they can go talk to their friend, text their friend to check in, or intervene in some other way. Step four, delay. For many reasons, you may not be able to do something right in the moment. For example, if you're feeling unsafe or if you're unsure whether or not someone in the situation is feeling unsafe, you may just want to check in with the person. In this case, you can combine a distraction technique by asking the person to use the bathroom with you or go get a drink with you to separate them from the person they're talking with. Then, this might look like asking them, are you okay? Or how can I help you get out of this situation? This could also look like texting the person, either in the situation or after you see them leave, and asking if they're okay or if they need any help. 
The action continuum. Take a second to consider this graphic. We want our ASU community to be confronting oppression and mitigating dangerous behaviors and possibilities. We can only do this by conducting ourselves in pro-social ways. Stay away from active participation and try to facilitate a community in which people feel comfortable initiating good actions and preventing problematic ones. So where do you fit in? Remember that it depends on your situation. Hopefully you exist in a pro-social community already, but ultimately it is up to you to help create one. There are many different areas in which people can step up. Some are covered in this guide, but can students think of others? Many of you may recall a story about two female student athletes from Central Washington who carried their opponent from Western Oregon all around the bases after she hit a home run but tore her ACL and couldn't walk. It was described as a home run trot that celebrated the collective human spirit far more than individual athletic achievement. Academics, stress, disordered eating, body image issues, depression, substance abuse, gambling, community service, sportsmanship issues, these are all areas in which people at ASU should be stepping up. So do what is right, not what is easy.